Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm a part-time professor at the University of Ottawa. I study abrupt climate change. I uh, look at the Ar Arctic and see how quickly it's warming and how the how it uh, changes uh, the jet streams. It slows them down. They become wavier, causing extreme weather events. And I also look at uh, methane coming up in the Arctic and all of the different uh, pieces of the climate change system puzzle. And what's brought you to Paris this COP21? My message is that the IPCC, um, the AR5, is just not, um, it's not capturing the, uh, the threat that we face. It's, it's underplaying the risk. But this is what's forming the basis of the policy that's being made here, which we're going to be hopefully celebrating next week. Yes, um, but the, the, um, the Arctic is warming extremely fast, and that lowers the temperature difference to the equator, which makes the jet streams uh, move much more slowly, become much become stuck and and cause much higher frequencies severities and durations of extreme weather events and we're possibly heading to a blue ocean event in the arctic where there's no sea ice at the end of the melt season say by 2020 and in a blue ocean event i mean describe what that actually means so a blue ocean event would there be minimal sea ice in the arctic uh, there might be some fast what's so-called fast ice around the shores, but there's essentially less than a million square kilometers of, of sea ice. And this has huge implications. But the models that are used by climate scientists to feed into the IPCC say that there's going to be ice in the Arctic right up until sort of 2050, 2070? Yes, the models uh, say that, but if you look at the trends, uh, they say something quite different. I mean, the, the ice uh, is, is getting extremely thin. And when you say trends, you mean observational if you, trends? Observational trends of both the um, sea ice extent, the area, the thickness, all of those trends are pointing to much faster ice loss than the so models uh, indicate. <coughs> Many people see that the loss of sea ice is actually a good thing because it gives us access to resources and it opens up shipping lanes. So, I mean, what's your message on that? Well, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It's not like Las Vegas. So uh, what happens is when, the, when we lose the sea ice, the Arctic is a much darker place. When it's a much darker place, there's much more absorption of solar radiation. Therefore, there's much more heating in the Arctic. This heating, um, both in the atmosphere and the oceans, is, is a very serious thing. In the oceans, the heating will, uh, will thaw out the um, clathrates on the ocean floor. So we're looking at a potential for very large methane release in the But Arctic. we're talking about two degrees at this conference. How does two degrees relate to the Arctic? Uh, two degrees is a global average temperature. The actual temperature rise in the Arctic um, is much, much higher. Um, so we've, 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 we've had about one degree C of warming over pre-industrial. That's the global That's average a global temperature. Mean. But the Arctic uh, temperature rise has been about four or five degrees over that same time period. And so what's the, do you know what is projected to be in various scenarios over the next 50 years? Well, uh, if we do in fact have a blue ocean event and we lose Arctic sea ice, then um, that, that would happen for maybe a month at the end of the melt season the first year. Um, the ice would take longer to reform, wouldn't be as, as thick in the winter. So within a few years, um, it is very probable that this, we'd have a blue ocean event for several months of the year, within a decade year round. And then we're skyrocketing up to a much warmer temperature. We're talking four or five degrees Celsius, not, not two degrees or one and a half degrees. And is it really that bad if we have a much warmer temperature? I mean, the, the biggest threat to uh, a very rapid warming in temperature or an abrupt climate change is the threat to, we have to eat food, we have to grow food. And uh, what happens is uh, we get areas that are get torrential rain, which flood out crops. We also get areas that are very arid deserts. For example, the, the, the Southern California, uh, U.S. South, Southwest um, food production could be severely stunted. Um, that drought will likely continue, could continue for decades, and that's the breadbasket for fruits in the, in the U.S., for example. California is one of the biggest economies in the world. I yes, mean, so yes. It's quite serious implications. Yeah, California, yes, it, it, it is. We're, we're, uh, we're facing extremely serious um, uh, implications to our society from climate change, and that's why I talk about... Uh, you're talking I, specifically about the Arctic climate yes, change affecting yes. the, the mid-latitudes, lower latitudes. Yes, it changes the nature of the jet streams and also it's changing in the last year we've noticed it's starting to change the nature of the ocean currents, the Gulf Stream for example. Okay. If the emissions continue to rise for the next 20 years, do you think we're at a risk of setting off feedbacks in the Earth system? Yes, the Earth system is a highly nonlinear system and 
we know that because the Earth's temperature has risen four, five, four, five, six degrees in the space of a decade or two at many times in, in the paleo record. But what, so when you say non-linear, just give us a description, a definition of non-linear. So what happens is the climate will increase sort of slowly linearly and suddenly it will jump up and then it will increase again. So it has a very sharp transition, a very non-linear. It's like you take a stick and you start bending it and it, and it bends a little bit and then you reach a certain point and it snaps and then you can't go back to where you were before. Or, or you're in a canoe and it's slowly tipping and then suddenly you go over, you're in the water. So it's like a tipping point. A tipping point, yes. And um, with feedbacks, I, as I understand it, there's, there's a danger that once they, they're set off, the man-made emissions are no longer the yes. end supporting you. Yes. They become self-sufficient. Yes, so, so that's the concern. Um, if we do lose the sea ice cover, then the Arctic is no longer a white uh, place that reflects a lot of sunlight. It's very, we have dark ocean water, which absorbs a lot of energy. So it, it basically throws us into a different uh, climate regime. So I think in terms of solutions, there's, uh, I think of it as a bar stool with three, um, three, three legs, if you like. And zeroing emissions is one of the legs, and that's what the IPCC and COP conferences are all about. But there are two other legs on the stool which um, are required and people don't talk about them as much. And what are these two legs? So, so one, another of the legs is um, carbon dioxide removal, CDR. We, uh, the, the present levels of, co of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere are, have destabilized the climate. It's not surprising because we've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere, so we're facing the consequences. So even if we zero emissions, the levels that we'll end up with, you know, we're at 400 parts per million now, maybe we'll be 450 by the time we zero emissions, if we're lucky, and then uh, we need to lower that back to about 350. Uh, which is what um, Bill McGibbon's group 350 now is advocating. Jim, James Hansen talks about it. Now, how do you remove billions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere? Well, you, uh, you basically see how nature, what, what are the sinks in nature that naturally remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? And you try to enhance those processes. So you use nature uh, to help you. So for example, uh, lots of carbon is stored in soils. So by taking this material called biochar and putting it in soils, it makes the soils more fertile, but it also stores a lot of carbon. Uh, by, stop, uh, by reducing uh, cutting down of trees, uh, replacing them with crop lands, uh, trees store a lot of carbon. Also, the oceans are a vast store for carbon. But if you take the, you, what you just said about the biochar, I mean, I think we, we currently um, mine and manage something like six or seven billion tons of iron ore every year. How would you, how would you take, the, let's say, 20, 30 billion tons of carbon, which you would need to do to get that temp get that uh, atmospheric carbon down. How yes. would you manage such? Yes, huge yes. We don't have the infrastructure. No, no, you no. You're right. But um, what, what that would be one wedge of the solution. Remove CO2. Uh, another would be um, enhancing phytoplankton growth, say in areas of the ocean like the South Pacific, where they're very nutrient limited. So nutrients there would increase uh, explosions of phytoplankton growth, which would capture carbon or olivine, for example. So you're describing technologies um, that are uh, in development. Well, they're technologies that we they're they're we know that they'll work, but you know what will it take us to scale them up? Um, that's that's the key issue. So so how much research is being done in this? Uh, nowhere near enough. I mean, it's, it's starting to um, get a lot more mainstream press. I've seen articles in The Economist, in Bloomberg, in um, The Atlantic. Many different places are talking about the uh, perhaps the necessity of, do, of doing that. So they're starting to get on board. And, uh, yeah. Um, so that was the the one stool. Was the oh, oh yeah. So this is, so we're, we've got two legs, but the stool is still unstable. Right? You, have stu you, yeah, need, so you need three. You need three, 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 three legs. So the third leg is the Arctic. Um, it's darker. Um, we it destabilizes the climate even more. So the extreme weather events that we see now will increase by probably an order of ten or twenty times um, if we lose sea ice. So we need to prevent the loss of sea ice and keep the methane in place in the sea, in the sediments on the ocean floor and in the terrestrial permafrost. So we need to cool the Arctic. So we need to look at solar radiation management techniques, SRM techniques, to do that on the short-term scale, to buy us time to zero emissions and... Describe, describe um, 
one, the technique, and two, how, how, how you would do it. Okay, well, one technique is uh, Stephen Salter's idea. Um, he's at uh, University of Edinburgh, I believe, and he, he talks about towers <laughs> um, pumping seawater up high, um, atomizing it, creating low-level marine clouds, which will then cause a cooling of the ocean, of the Gulf Stream as it's moving north, for example. That's one sort of method that could be done many different places. Another method I, I term the anthropogenic Arctic volcano. So if you seed, we know volcanoes cool the climate, so if you seed parts of the Arctic in summer with, with sulfur dioxide up in the stratosphere, you will cause a cooling of the planet. But I thought the models showed that if you pump this stuff into the Arctic, that it actually gets dispersed around out different parts of the planet. It, it will get dispersed over time, but it, it will the concentration will be higher. When there's a volcano, we, we, we know very accurately, very well, where the sulfur dioxide goes and how long it takes to go to, to move and so on. One of the one of the big um, issues that I've I've heard is that if you pump all this stuff up into the into the stratosphere you could shut off something like the Indian monsoon and yeah. therefore cause even bigger hardship than already okay. is there. Okay, so the, the, um, whenever the topic is discussed, it, it's always what will happen if we do it. Um, just as important, in fact, more important is what will happen if we do not do it. And uh, if we do not do it, extreme weather events will ramp up and we won't, what we see now, what we consider extreme weather events now will be the completely the norm and things will get much worse to growing crops and to infrastructure. So if we don't do it, we're heading to a very bad place. So doing it, uh, all I, I would argue that doing it, I mean, just from a high level top down view of the climate system, if we bring it closer to what we had before, we'll have more stability. And if we cool the Arctic, we'll bring the system closer to what we had before. I mean, the warming in the Arctic is surely having huge impacts on monsoons and uh, everything else. In fact, it impacts the sea ice in Antarctica even. Um, so it's a global, it's a global, global effect. Because the Arctic is warming so much from solar radiation, there's less heat moving from the equator up to the Arctic, so more heat moves to the southern hemisphere, and that increases the temperature gradient between Australia and Antarctica and, and causes the jet streams to strengthen there and causes the enlargement of sea ice in Antarctica. So we're talking about a global system, and not enough people study the overall climate system. People are too siloed, scientists are too siloed, um, to, to, and rarely think about the entire system. But there's an issue, isn't there, that if you're talking about um, managing global climate, taking control of the climate, if yeah. you like, which in one argument again is that we've already done that. We've done that, yes. Um, if, we're, if we're taking that further, even meaningfully trying to do it, then we could be doing things that make the poor, poorer nations suffer even more to save probably Western nations. Uh, or more we, we, developed we, nations. We, we could, but again, um, we need to weigh the balance of, of, of not doing it with doing it. And I would argue that it's extremely clear that if we don't do it, the poor nations will suffer a lot more than they, they would if we did. I mean, all I'm trying to do is say, yeah, we can possibly, we have a good shot at bringing the climate system closer to what we had for most of the Holocene, which was a fairly stable, climate conducive to human economic process and growth and civilization growth. So your final say on geoengineering is that we should do more research. Well, I don't like the term geoengineering because it's, it's like saying black or white, we do it or we not. I mean, geoengineering, like carbon dioxide removal, is pretty unobtrusive. It's just trying to return the chemistry of the atmosphere back to what we had before. Solar radiation management, you know, we do that on ski hills when we make snow on a ski hill, for example. So I think we need certainly need to, we can't discount these methods. I think they'll all be required. And people, when people start panicking about the, about the abrupt climate change, then they'll be calling for these methods. So we better know what we're doing when that happens. Thank you, Paul Beckwith. Thank we'll you very talk much. Talk to you again.